welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Vanessa Rose, and so happy that you decided to tune in and join us today. If you just happen to be passing by, make sure and stay tuned. We have a great program ahead for you. We're so happy to be joined by Phil McElveen, who is the CEO of New Exodus Incorporation. Thank you so much for joining us, Phil. Well. Very happy to have you. So uh, before we go ahead and dive into the first topic, if you'd go ahead and share a little bit with the viewing audience about yourself. Um, about myself, wow. We, New Exodus, there's, there's really two companies that are based out of New Exodus. New Exodus does medical flight programs, cancer patient assistance programs. We have a summer school for children um, that don't have any parents, adoptive, foster, foster respite. Um, so we have a graphic design school, production for kids, and uh, feeding program. So it's really into the community, but it's based out of, uh, if you're going to live in Phoenix, you might as well bless it. So yes. uh, we do a lot of community work. Uh, partner with a lot of community 501c3 and nonprofits um, to better serve what needs are lacking in the in the area whether it's mental health whether it's behavioral health mm -hmm. um, lots of work with addicts and alcoholics um, and then we do uh, on the other side we do uh, cause marketing um, so we take money from companies that normally would spend it and we put it try to put it back into the community and help different causes that are lacking areas of funding for services. So that's, that's kind wonderful. of it in a nutshell. And I know that you kind of got into that arena because you yourself have, have a history as, as, an, as an addict, correct? Absolutely. I uh, have the blessing and the honor to be sober, um, and um, at least for today, as they always say. But yeah. I come from not only a uh, alcoholic addiction background, um, but was very blessed to also work in the field as a clinician after I got sober. Wow. So there's a, kind of a, a definitely, definitely an experience part to it and a workload part to it and, and uh, definitely a passion. So yeah, you have a heart for it because you've been there. Absolutely. So, um, so, so our first issue we're speaking about is drugs and alcohol and we are speaking about recovery from alcoholism and addiction. That I'm sure is a very broad topic we could spend a lot of time on, but sure. addiction, what, what does addiction mean? Well, the, you know, there's the, uh, the phrase that people say in recovery is this, what classifies an addict is really their admits, their admits to themselves that they have a problem. Um, the way that I've always viewed it, as I can only speak for myself, is it's been taught to me if it's causing me drugs or alcohol, uh, financial problems, relationship problems, legal problems, yeah. or medical problems, it's probably time to take a look at what those reasons are. Um, and if that behavior is putting you into situations that are becoming harmful and you're not able to stop that behavior. And that's how I was always taught to classify an addict uh, or an alcoholic in that manner. Speaking of alcoholic, alcoholism, how do you know that someone is an alcoholic? Because I know there's people that drink or will have a drink maybe one a day, but what, what really constitutes an alcoholic and how do you know if you are or if someone that you love is? Well, first of all, that's a really good question. How do you know if somebody's an alcoholic? They admit it. That's the first thing. It's not for somebody else to claim somebody is an alcoholic or an addict. It's for them themselves to admit that they are. Um, are there warning signs? Yeah. yeah, yeah. For somebody that you love, care about, friend, um, different stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of different warning signs, and they're different with each drug of choice, whether it might be alcohol or maybe drugs, uh, drugs itself. Um, but you know, there's a lot of different things that go involved with that. You know, cash flows down, mm -hmm. uh, missing time, can't account for different time, depressed, lonely, isolated, job loss. You know, and then and that behavior comes out and angry and and emotions and fluctuation and there's it's a change of behavior mm -hmm. and a change of lifestyle that makes it evident going hey what's going on over here um, and those are the questions where you have to be really careful with an alcoholic and an addict I'm trying to be of help so mm -hmm. you don't spoil an opportunity at a later date that might be a blessing of sobriety and yes. kind of saying hey uh, how can I be of help to you in that way without having so many people get deemed and, and they get railroaded and they get put down for being an alcoholic or an addict and it's a disease and yes. they're suffering so they need help. So is that the best way to approach it then if you have someone that you know I is, is by help or what's the best way to approach that because I know that can be a very touchy subject especially if they don't want help. Well the way, the, the way that first of all every situation is different so that happens to do with teens or adults mm -hmm. so uh, first of all if you're if it's a, an, a teen obviously if you're the parent or the guardian you're going to approach it as a parental aspect mm -hmm. But you also want to remember that they're in their minds they're doing something illegal, so they already know they're in trouble. So you know I would approach it. You know you know who, check out who their friends are, check out what they're doing. The best way to find out about uh, a child and what their behavior is is find out who they're hanging around with and where they're going, mm -hmm. um, and then set the basis for a, a talk out, out of love and concern. But 
Um, and then as an adult, like I said, every situation is different too. Um, flat out ask is, is usually the way we do. If somebody's not ready, they're not going to admit it, then there is no uh, reason to take it any farther as they talk about in recovery. Our job in recovery is to share our experience, strength, and hope with somebody, hoping that they yes. can relate to it and then say, hey, I want some help, I want what you got. Um, if they're not willing, then you're going to spoil an opportunity possibly at a later date to help them. Uh, don't push them, don't force them. Mm -hmm. It's got to come between them, somebody greater than themselves, and a decision from them if it's going to be the best chance for them to recover. Do you find that working with, addic with, with addicts and being, being one at one point in your life, do you find that sometimes people have to hit bottom before they really can be woken up and realize sometimes they're not willing to take that help? Well, you made two great points, uh, being an addict at a time. I'm still an addict and will always be an addict. Um, is there a bottom? Do they have to hit a bottom? I, yeah, only problem with me is I never, I always found a basement. I was a, <laughs> I was a little lower than yeah, my bottom. Yeah, exactly. So, um, it takes to a point of getting spiritually, emotionally, and physically bankrupt to where you have nothing left in reaching out. Now, does that take that for everybody? No. Some people have different levels of where their bankruptcy begins within themselves. Um, some people wind up on the street. Uh, some people wind up in the hospital. Some people wind up in jail. Some people wind up in a casket um, and anywhere in between. So it's all different uh, in between those. For me, I had to, I had to wind up years ago I couldn't stop. Mm. Even I, I wanted to so bad, um, so I had to be stopped yeah. um, for an opportunity for sobriety to take place. Sobriety is a way of life. Being clean is one thing. Being sober is a whole another story. Wow. So I had to actually be stopped, and, and luckily for years ago with uh, programs and, and different stuff that they had, um, and jail, spending a night over in the tents, stuff like that which then I could find out. I found uh, recovery meetings. I found people who cared. I found people that I could relate to that didn't put me down. Yes. And that helped me. And is that important for people that are trying to recover, that are in recovery, to surround themselves with people that are of that? Because I know I've had friends that struggled with alcoholism, went into sobriety, and then they went around those people that were drinking, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I've, I've tried to encourage them, you know, maybe you should stay away from that. It's, it's important to surround yourself yeah, with that. Yeah, you know, you know, the, you know, the old <laughs> phrase, it sounds weird, but if you're a cat and you hang around dogs long, pretty soon, you're going to bark. So the surrounding yourself with like-minded people, like-hearted people with the same type of goals increases your chance at staying uh, so, your sobriety. And sobriety is contingent on your daily maintenance is a very spiritual disease. Yeah. So having support, having those people next to you that can relate to the same things you've went to, the same turmoil, and it all relates to one thing, pain. Yeah. It really relates down to pain, and if you look at any alcoholic or an addict, they're trying not to live life on life's terms by masking it with that drug or alcohol for whatever they've been through. And uh, there is a, a huge healing process that goes through that. And that being said, alcoholism, drug addiction, isn't necessarily something that's consistent. I know that binge drinking is a big issue as well. Is that considered as a form of alcoholism, and how can you help someone with that? You know, it's funny. They did American Medical Association, uh, and this is a while ago, but did it a uh, huge statistic aspect for binge drinking on teens and kids in school. Mm. And binge drinking was always classified as, you know, three to five drinks uh, or three to six drinks. And 80% of uh, children, by the time they hit 15, were binge drinkers. Wow. Uh, the survey they took. They even went as far as taking them into stores, and they took children of alcoholics and children uh, and addicts and, and children of parents that weren't alcoholics and addicts and told them to go shopping for a party. And the people of alcoholics and addicts went and bought beer. They, they had their run of the wow. place. They went and bought <laughs> cigarettes. The people of non-alcoholics and addicts went and bought party hats, cakes, stuff like that. Wow. So definitely children mimic what they see. Um, definitely adults have a big role in playing what they project onto children and at the same time uh, addicts no matter young or old uh, plug yourself in look into the phone book um, find different just look up alcohol mm -hmm. uh, you'll find drugs within all that kind of stuff yeah. there are so many type it in on the internet uh, you're never going to see it too much on TV on specifics because anonymity is really important to an addict so you have to be able to refer them and let them do the work to find the help too. Mm -hmm. but go to the internet go to the phone book and there's a lot of shows like this that bring companies on yes. that can refer you over to places to help you as well. Is, is there a certain demographic or age that's really affected by this? Uh, well, yeah, I, I would say 
<laughs> alcoholism addict can affect anybody. Yeah. But the biggest demographic uh, of age that's affected, I, I, I would venture to say, uh, in, and that would differ from opinion from people that work with youth services than adult services, but there's a bigger age gap of adults because kids usually are only kids till what, 16, 17, mm -hmm. maybe 18. Adults are from 17 to 80. Yeah. So obviously the higher age groups are gonna have the most area demographic. Uh, the longer you use, historically it says the harder to get uh, sober. So um, that, but there is a huge amount of kids that need help in this battle. Yes, there, there is and I think that's something that, like you said, as a parent, especially if you step out and help your child or if, you're, if you have a, your child's friend and you see that they need help, maybe step out and, and help them. And just whenever you, whenever you have some, some sort of addiction, is it better to try to find something to replace that addiction in a way? Because I, I know that addictive personalities a lot of time are what cause that. So is it, is it important to find an activity or something to replace that addiction? Yeah, I host a show. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, but I was always told, you know, you wind up through the elements of sobriety, through uh, working through the steps and, and meetings and all the stuff that goes along with all that kind of stuff, but your life changes. So you automatically are replacing it with meetings, if you're doing your, your program. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was always told, you know, start exercising. Yeah. Start, it's like quitting smoking. You got to replace it with something because there is a mental aspect to it. And people don't realize it's not the physical part of a, of a person that straightens out first. Yes. It is the spiritual part, then the physical. Mm -hmm. So I would say change, your, it takes something greater than yourself to believe in. So yes. that takes up some of your time. Exercise, spend some time, you know, with other people, other alcoholics and addicts. You will learn more and listen more and hear more. Yeah, and I think also if you if you are in recovery and you hang around and maybe see those people and the way they behave and the way that they are, it almost will be a reality check to say, wow, I don't want to be that way. <laughs> or I do want to be that way. Or I do want to be, yeah. <laughs> or I do want to be that way, but hopefully that's not the outcome here, right? You know, but, they, they get a chance to learn. If, yeah. if he can make it and they hear the story, oh, wow, I went through that. And well, if he can do it, I can do it. And it gives them hope. Yes. And if you're in pain, the cure for that is hope. Yes. That's really what it's about. That's wonderful. Well, Phil, thank you so much. Like I said, I know we could speak about this forever, but very much appreciate you being here to share with our viewing yeah. audience about this. And I know that you at home have enjoyed this. I'm sure that you've known someone in your life, or if you're struggling with it, there's so many resources out there for you to get help. And I know that Phil would be more than happy to answer any questions you have. You can reach him at New Exodus, and the number is 888 seven four seven nine seven six four and the website is new exodus that's e-x-o-d-o-s dot o-r-g thank you so much for tuning in for this first segment of joy in our town we look forward to seeing you in just a few seconds prison doesn't just lock up a parent it incarcerates the entire family don't try to do it all alone for more information on mentoring for children of the incarcerated, contact mykairoscommunity.org or call 1-800-298-2730, extension 22. Hello and welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I hope that you're having a fabulous day and thank you so much for tuning in. If you happen to be passing by, please stay tuned. We have a great program. This is the second half of our show and we are here with Laura Larson Huffaker and she is with La Frontera Impact Suicide Prevention Center. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. Thank you for having me. So happy to have you and we're gonna be speaking about drugs and alcohol, but before we do that, if you'd go ahead and share a little bit with the audience about yourself and the organization you work with. Well, I, um, I've been with La Frontera Arizona Impact for 16 years. I'm the executive director, and um, it's a wonderful organization. We provide substance abuse programs for um, teens as well as adults. Mm. We also have very specialized programs in the area of suicide prevention. We answer the National Suicide Hotline for Arizona. Wow. We um, answer the National Rape and Incest Hotline. We have trauma programs for people who have been victimized. Um, we have support groups for people who have lost a loved one to suicide. Um, and so uh, a big part of what we do is suicide prevention as well. That is wonderful. So you're more than qualified to be here working with people and thank you so much for helping those people because some they, they all, everyone needs help, right? And everyone needs right. love. So right. that's wonderful. Yes. So thank you so much for joining us and we're going to be seeking, like I said, about drugs and alcohol and suicide and addiction is what we're going to be covering today. Um, does, does drug addiction relate to suicide? 
Um, it does. Um, drug addiction um, is actually a warning sign. One of the risk factors for suicide that you look at is if somebody is using substances because um, sub substance use um, lowers inhibition, might make people more impulsive, and a lot of suicide ends up being an impulsive act. And so um, another connection between the two is that people that use substances are often, um, they have co-occurring disorders. They may have a mental illness, and they use the substances to help mask the symptoms or deal with pain. And um, a lot of the same mental illnesses are related to suicide, depression, and bipolar disorder. Wow. So um, there is definitely a connection. There is. And you also said that you work with people who have had been raped or incest. Right. Is that, does that seem to be a major factor in suicide attempts? Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is um, what happens when you've had a trauma and um, then you, ha you end up reliving it throughout your life and you can't let go of it and it causes a lot of pain and wow. re-traumatization and that definitely, um, that population is also at risk for suicide. Wow, that's, that's terrible and they may have never had the opportunity to get help Yes, or that's to, true. So, so is it important then to go and get counseling and things of that nature? Definitely. There is help. People feel like, you know, this happened. Nobody can take it away. How can you help me? But um, there are definitely good um, counseling programs that work specifically with trauma victims. Wow, that's, that's, that's wonderful to know. And I know later we're going to give some information of how people can get information about that. So children and adults, are they both affected by this? And how, how does that differ? Um, unfortunately, yes, both are affected by both drug abuse and suicide. Um, the difference is uh, a lot of them are because of the environments in which you mm -hmm. find children and adults, and so um, the warning signs might look different for a child. You know, children go to school, they're required to do some writing. A lot of children who are suicidal will start writing about death, and, and they're kind of preoccupied with it. Um, and adults, you know, they may, they may be talking to their friends. Both of them would um, potentially talk to people about suicide. Uh -huh. uh, children are more likely to do something impulsive, which is why the substance abuse is important, because they don't necessarily have the means, and so they don't plan it as often as adults do. They may stumble upon the means and do an impulsive act. Do you find that children that are suicidal, is, is it an effect of the home? Is it an effect of the outside life? I know that recently there's been several suicides of young kids who've been bullied at school. Right. Do you find that it's, it's, it's a whole effect of their, their environment or their home? And how, how can people reach out and help them? Um, the home life can really be, uh, make a difference in terms of building resiliency in children. And that's actually an offset for a risk factor. So if they have high risk factors, but they are resilient and they have the ability to um, bring themselves up out of pain and that kind of thing. Um, so a home life can really help in providing a child support and hope and um, a feeling of safety and belonging and those things. Um, so that if a child is being bullied at school or is having um, got yelled at by the teacher mm -hmm. or got a bad grade or broke up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they, they can turn to their home life and um, find some comfort and support and strength there. So um, that, that could be a make or break for some children. And then going the opposite way, let's say they don't have a great home life. In schools, right. is, is there, is there in, in place guidelines that teachers and counselors watch for that they would be able to pr pr approach the child and help them? Yes, um, most, most schools, um, a lot of the schools now are training their teachers and their school counselors um, in the warning signs of, of suicide and so um, they can recognize those things, the children that are withdrawing from their friends and, and who are um, getting bad grades all of a sudden even though they're bright kids mm -hmm. or they're um, starting to talk or write about suicide, that kind of thing, or oh. death. So they've, they've been trained to look for these things and then they can call you know, a hotline yes. or you know, if they need, feel like they need something more imminent. Is it important then? What, what, what are signs that parents should watch for if they are involved with their kids but they, they may be changing their behaviors? What's something that they should watch for if their children or teenagers are struggling with that? Um, if the child is um, all of a sudden using substances, which you can tell that by the mm -hmm. fact that they start, stop, you know, start hanging around with some different kind of people. Yeah. Um, if the child is not wanting to participate in their activities, you know, they might be in sports and that kind of thing, and they start withdrawing from those extracurricular activities. Um, parents can look for um, changes in the child's patterns. You know, they don't sleep or they're not eating or they, you know, they're not hanging out with their friends. 
um, and certainly if they're talking about suicide. And maybe be nosy, right? It's always oh, good definitely. to know. Yes. Look, look through their notebooks, see yeah. what they're writing, see what they're doing through their, yes. now more than their notebooks, their cell phones, right? Right, the, who they're texting, what, what's going on yeah. there. And interestingly, a lot of children, you know, they're, they're really good at hiding it from their parents, but they will tell their friends. And mm -hmm. so that's something for, that we teach, you know, when we go into schools and, and places where there are children, youth programs and that kind of thing, we tell kids, you know, if your friend tells you or you're, that they might be considering suicide and they tell you don't tell anyone, that's not a secret you want to keep. You definitely want to tell somebody. And so adults, now, now that covering children and youth, adults, mm -hmm. what's some sure signs to see if you have a friend and you notice that they're kind of withdrawing? What should you look for as an adult and a friend or maybe as a parent if you have an adult child or it maybe if you're a child and you have an adult parent that's older, what, what should you watch for and, and how do you approach someone who may be considering suicide? Um, you might listen for them actually saying things like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to live anymore, this life is too hard, and things that sound hopeless and, and sound like a person is, isn't um, wanting to live anymore. Also, a lot of times, adults will start giving away possessions. They, they know that they're going to be doing this, you know, so if it's a planned oh. suicide, um, they might start using substances. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of different things, changes in behavior. They might start withdrawing and stop calling and, and kind of shut in and be by themselves. Um, so, you know, if, if you see something like that, and, and people don't realize, they think, well, if somebody's going to kill themselves, you know, they're going to do it, I can't do anything. Yeah, and, you know, ultimately, true. you know, sometimes that's true, but no, you're right, that is not true, because they, they people can make a huge yeah. difference in somebody else's life. And so if, you know, if you see something like that, I would start by acknowledging it with the person, you know what, I'm afraid, I'm worried about you. You've been, you've been talking about death, you've been, you know, withdrawing, you don't, you don't ever call anymore. Maybe and bring them to a meeting or to mm -hmm. something where they can get yeah. hope, yeah. Yeah, they can bring them to a meeting, they can bring them to, to church, they can bring mm -hmm. them to, um, a, you know, to a counseling agency. Um, they can call a hotline. If, if you're worried about a friend and you haven't been able to get that friend to get help, you can call the hotline and say, what can I do? Can wow. somebody help this person? And, and they'll help you. Do you, do you find a lot of times with suicide victims, especially adults, that substance abuse is, comes, comes before that and it's almost like something that follows to where they hit that, that rock bottom place and then that's the last, res, the last res, resort mm -hmm. that they, they believe is the last resort? Or do you find that that kind of follows a pattern? Oftentimes it does. So people that use substances will get to that bottom point and um, you know, not everybody that kills themselves uses substances, but a significant amount that is a connection that way. Is what do you, do you know what is the biggest cause of suicide? Is it is it is it overdosing or is it alcohol or is it oh the means um, yeah for actually for men more more women attempt suicide than men but the but more men complete suicide so when a man actually attempts those numbers are changing but um, for a man firearms is a big one using a gun wow. um, and more recently um, among teens men and women hanging has become um, a popular method which is that's a tough one to prevent. You know, you can remove guns and, and that kind of thing, but you can hang yourself from anything. So that's a tough one for a lot of people to, in terms of removing the means. Wow. So if a family has someone that did commit suicide, what, what's available to them for therapy and for help? And actually a family or a close friend. Um, at, at Impact, we provide, and, and there are programs, uh, other programs uh -huh. throughout the state, they're called survivors of suicide support groups, and they're actually run by somebody who has lost a loved one to suicide. So they understand what somebody's going through. And the programs make a huge difference in helping the person to come to terms, not only with the fact that a loved one has died, but that they died by suicide, and, the, and the, oftentimes the guilt and the, you know, the, just the pain that goes with that kind of death. So that's, uh, the support groups are a huge help for people. Yes, and dual diagnosis, what, what is that? Um, dual diagnosis is when somebody has um, a behavioral health disorder as well as a substance use disorder. Mm. So they're using, abusing substances and they have a mental illness. And a lot of times they do go hand in hand. So somebody might have, um, be bipolar and not be able to control their moods and they're very anxious and so then they turn to substances and obviously they end up, it ends up compounding each other. Is there any specific household items that people should be aware of that someone could use to try and commit suicide or to overdose on? Um, a lot of times people will use, um, they'll, they'll make concoctions of, of even uh, pain prescription medications. Mm. If you take enough of them, obviously, then that could be lethal. 
um, even things like aspirin and and, and, Advil and, and, and large those amount kind of things could be in lethal. large amounts could be. Um, and then you know people have looked through the house for poisons and that kind of thing. So all of the things that you know the warning labels on the bottle say do not ingest if you ingest it. So and people will use anything. Well, yeah, and something as simple as I know that now if you get certain cough syrups and stuff, you have to sign and you have to be of a certain right. age. Do people do people often try to attempt suicide with things of that nature? Um, I have not heard of a lot with in terms of cough syrups, but definitely prescription well, just household medications. Items, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, definitely. That is one. Yeah. That that is, and, and especially younger people that don't necessarily have access to yeah. some of the other means, and you know they'll go through their medicine cabinets and. So where, where can someone go at, at this point if they're contemplating suicide? What, what is your suggestion to them? Where, where, do, where do they go? If, if they're willing to get help and they're, con and they're feeling suicidal imminently, like I don't feel safe right now because I might kill myself, definitely go to, to an emergency facility. Um, if it's not quite, or, or call the hotline. That's something you can do even right from your own home. Call, call um, a crisis suicide hotline. If they're um, feeling like I might do it at some point and I just want to get some help so I don't go down that road, then they can go to um, counseling agencies yes. that have programs for, like we talked about, post-traumatic stress yes. or substance abuse or whatever the issue might be. Yes. Well, Laura, that is that is so great. It's so sad to hear, but so great that you're out there helping and it, there you. is ways that people can get help. Definitely. So thank you so much for joining us well, thank on Join Our you Town. For having me. And I know that we have some numbers for you at home. And if you happen to be contemplating suicide or if you know someone that is, you can reach Laura Larson Huffaker at La Frontera Impact Suicide Prevention Center. And their in general information line is 480-784-1514. The suicide hotline here in Phoenix is 480-784-1500. And the national suicide hotline is 1-800-273-TALK. That's T-A-L-K. And the website is impact slash spc.com. Thank you so much at home for watching. I hope that this has been helpful and educational to you. I know that so many people are affected by this every day, and I think one of the things we learned is don't be shy. If, if, you, if you have someone that you're concerned about and that is a loved one and that you love, step out there and speak to them. Love on them. A lot of times people lose hope, especially now with the economy the way it is and people who have lost jobs and homes and have families. All they need is a little bit of love and help. So thank you so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you next time right here on Joy in Our Town. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town brought to your home every day. So write Joy in Our Town, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.